Christians Before Christ is an argument for mythicism. It seeks to establish that there were Jesus-worshipping communities practising before 30 AD, the supposed date of Jesus' death. This would of course make it impossible for the death and resurrection of Jesus to be the key event in the founding of Christianity. And from there it's a short step to Jesus not being a historical figure. The argument has been recently popularised by Michael Lawrence, whose documentary video Just Suppose can be found on YouTube and is referenced below. It is generally true that the wide distribution and the diversity of the very early Christian church places a significant time constraint on its development between the dates of Jesus' death and resurrection and of Paul's letters some 20 to 25 years later, but it does seem possible. Paul's letters make little reference to the history of the congregations he is writing to, and neither do they contain comments which would enable us to infer how long the congregations had existed. There are, however, ancient writings that may suggest the existence of Christian communities before 30 AD. One of these is the first epistle of Clement to the Corinthians. This letter has been known about since ancient times, but was lost until it was discovered in part in an ancient Greek Bible that was given by Patriarch Cyril of Jerusalem to England's King Charles I in 1628. A complete copy was found in 1873 in the Jerusalem Codex, which was written in Greek in 1056. The epistle is a long letter at over 12,000 words. It was occasioned by a dispute that had arisen in the Church of Corinth that resulted in several presbyters being ousted. It is conventionally dated between 80 and 140 AD and is traditionally dated to the year 96 because in the second paragraph it refers to successive sudden and calamitous events that have occurred to the church in Rome. And this is traditionally associated with the persecution of Christians at the end of the reign of Emperor Domitian in AD 96. But there is no concrete reason for believing that this is the calamity that the letter refers to. The other significant contributor to dating is historical context, and this means where the letter fits in our understanding of the history of the early church. Clement refers to the Corinthian church as being ancient, and also mentions members who have been faithful from childhood to old age, and beliefs held by our fathers before us, and we are now old both of which suggest that the churches in question, there being the Roman and Corinthian churches, had been in existence for some time. How long is not clear, but it had to be more than about 40 years. In terms of church history then, this means the letter must have been written at least 40 years after the 30s AD. And this leads to the conclusion that these successive, sudden and calamitous events were the Domitian persecution. This dating is the reason why the letter is attributed to Clement. He was Bishop of Rome at the time. The letter is, however, anonymous, simply stating that it is from the Roman to the Corinthian church, with no reference to who wrote it. Now, there is a major and specific problem with this dating scheme, and that is that the letter refers in the present tense to sacrifices occurring at the temple in Jerusalem. This temple was destroyed in AD 70 and in Rome there had been a major victory parade after the destruction and a commemorative arch erected with carvings of the temple treasures that were carried off as booty such as the seven-branched candlestick. Anyone writing from Rome after this date must therefore surely have known of the temple's destruction. That means that either the letter was written before 70 AD or we are mistaken about the accuracy and meaning of the present tense reference to the Jerusalem temple. The letter also refers to Peter and Paul and to apostolic writings and therefore assuming our dates of these is correct must date from after about 50 AD. What this means is that if the letter was not written later than 70 AD and it implies churches that had been in existence for over 40 years, then there had to be churches in existence before 30 AD. And this is obviously a damning conclusion for historicity. This claim can be countered in a number of ways, the least credible being to try to squeeze the history of these churches as represented into the letter into under 40 years. This requires that when referring to people as old, the letter means they were in their 30s. 
Even though life expectancy was much shorter in the ancient world than it is today, this is a stretch and is not consistent with the use of the term old in other ancient writing. Another counter is to question the accuracy and meaning of the present tense reference to the Temple of Jerusalem. The text is quite explicit and it is hard to argue that it was referring to something other than the second temple, as there never has been a third temple. There is evidence from the Talmud that Jewish worship at the temple site did continue after the end of the war in AD 70, until Jews were banished from Jerusalem by Hadrian after the Bar Kokhba revolt was put down in 135 AD. And the letter therefore could have been referring to these practices, but the wording is quite explicit here in chapter 41. Not in every place, brethren, are the daily sacrifices offered, or the peace offerings, or the sin offerings, and the trespass offerings, but in Jerusalem only. And even there they are not offered in any place, but only at the altar before the temple, that which is offered first being carefully examined by the high priest and the ministers already mentioned. No one has come up with an argument that this bit was added or altered after the writing of the original letter, partly because the likely motivation to alter it would simply delete it or place it in the past tense, as such alterations were either accidental or motivated by the church's desire to suppress heresy. As the reference to the Jerusalem temple has a much harder dating than the non-specific reference to calamities, which are used to date the letter to 96 AD, the case for Christians prior to 30 AD from Clement's letter seems fairly strong. Another text used by Lawrence is the Epistle of Barnabas. We have a complete and early version of this epistle, which appears at the end of the New Testament in the Codex Sinaiticus. It is written in Greek and is dated in the range 100 to 131 AD. The main theme of the letter is that Christianity has superseded the religion of Second Temple Judaism. We don't know who wrote it, when it was written, or who it was written to. The dating issue arises in chapter 16 verses 3 and 4 where the author states, Furthermore, he says again, Behold, those who tore down this temple will themselves build it. It is happening now. For because of their fighting it was torn down by the enemies, and now the very servants of the enemies will themselves rebuild it. The problem is that the only occasion on which a Jewish temple was destroyed and then rebuilt was when Solomon's temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC, and then rebuilt at a date we don't know for sure, but it's given in the Old Testament as being 516 BC, 70 years after the destruction. Michael Lawrence argues that this means that Barnabas' epistle should be redated to the 6th century BC. The fact that the epistle contains extensive reference to Christianity would then place a Christian community in the 6th century BC. For one thing, such a large redating, placing a Christian community or communities in the 6th century BC, is not supported by any other evidence. Another thing is that although no third temple was ever completed, there was considerable temple site activity that persisted after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. This area has been extensively researched because of its connection with the rival claims of historical precedence over the Temple Mount today. Emperor Hadrian, who reigned from 117 to 138 AD, granted permission for the Jews to rebuild the temple in order to secure their cooperation. Preparations began, but Hadrian changed his mind and the project was stopped. Bar Kokhba took control of Jerusalem in 132 AD in the course of his ill-fated revolt and it is entirely possible that building work on the new temple then resumed. Bar Kokhba was finally defeated in 135 AD, at which point Hadrian banished Jews from Jerusalem and had the Temple Mount area raised. He forbade Jews from worshipping on the site, the first such restriction by the Romans. It is therefore not at all unreasonable to infer that Barnabas was referring to these activities, which are consistent with modern dating of his epistle. So while the case for Jesus worshipping communities predating 30 AD is not proven, there are reasons from Clement and the known diversity and distribution of early Jesus worshipping congregations to believe it credible. If that is accepted, then it weakens the case for a historical Jesus substantially. 
Overall, therefore, this is not the most powerful argument in the debate, but it is one of the more powerful ones, and it does favour mythicism. Before I go, there is one other point about Clement and Barnabas. Whenever their dates, all agree they are relatively early Christian texts. And as with many other early Christian texts, such as the genuine epistles of Paul, they appear to be completely unaware of the gospel stories. They refer to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, but never to his sayings or deeds, nor his historical or geographical context. They therefore appear to support the basic tenet of the argument I discuss in my video on the silence of Paul.